So good morning, everyone. Um, this webinar this morning is presented by the Minnesota Local Technical Assistance Program at the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota LTAP is sponsored by the Minnesota Local Road Research Board and the Federal Highway Administration. LTAP is a program designed to provide local transportation agencies with the tools for improving operations. LTAP's ultimate goal is to foster a safe, efficient, environmentally sound transportation system by improving skills and knowledge of local transportation providers through training events, demonstrations, technical assistance, and technology transfer. Minnesota LTAP provides multiple training opportunities throughout the year, including annual events, technical workshops, and self-paced online courses. You can visit our training and events calendar for all upcoming opportunities. Minnesota LTAP has a variety of newsletters, reference documents, videos, a website, and provides library services and technical document searches. Minnesota LTAP supports local agency innovations through two programs, Build a Better Mousetrap and Operational Research Assistance Program. Mousetrap is a state and national competition. Your entry can be anything from the develop, development of tools or gadgets to equipment modifications to processes that increase safety, improve efficiency, reduce costs, or improve the quality of transportation. The purpose of this competition is to collect and disseminate real world examples of best practices tips from the field and assist in the transfer of technology. OPERA provides funding to develop your ideas. OPERA funds projects up to $20,000 through a request for proposal process. Proposed projects should focus on the timely development of relevant ideas or methods that improve transportation or maintenance operations. And then I wanna just acknowledge and congratulate our 2020 Rhodes Scholar graduates who have listed here. And then before I pass things over to Tom, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to our instructor today. So Thomas Wood has worked in the pavement field for over 40 years. He has worked for MnDOT both in maintenance and asphalt research. He also worked for an asphalt supplier and consulting engineering firm. He is currently employed, employed by Aztec Corp as a pavement specialist, helping customers with any pavement issues. Tom has a strong passion for keeping good roads good longer. He has been married for over 41 years with four children and 11 grandchildren and one great grandchild and another on the way. Um, in his spare time, Tom enjoys tractor pulling, fishing and hunting. And then just real quick before I pass things over. So today in the meeting, we're asking that you keep yourself on mute unless you're talking and there's a Q&A portion. Video is completely optional. And if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. I'll be monitoring throughout our time this morning and you know I can bring them up so that Tom can hear them. So Tom, I'm gonna pass things over to you now. Okay, thanks, Claire. Good, good morning, everybody. Okay, just bear with me here just a little bit. Okay, uh, well, good morning and thank you for allowing me to, to share crack sealing and crack filling and we're gonna talk about mastic. Uh, I know a lot of you people have been around a long time, but a lot of new folks, uh, when I do training, uh, and when we do it in person, I really encourage uh, asking questions, interaction. Uh, if you have a question, there's probably 10 other people that have the same question. So you take advantage of the chat feature that Claire talked about. And if, if uh, we need to go a little more in depth, then we'll unmute and we can have a direct conversation. So with that, let's get started. So today we're going to talk about crack sealing, crack filling, mastic. And as Claire said, I work for Aztec and it's sort of a unique role 
in the fact that I'm not doing any marketing. I'm basically doing sharing information. It, uh, the owner of the company said, you know, you've been doing this for years. We hate to see you just retire and not be available to help people. And it's really, it's, it's really been a fun six, seven months so far. So anyhow. So Claire, is there any way I can get that bar off the, oh, okay, there I got it. So uh, crack treatment overview. We're gonna talk about when, why and when. Payment evaluation or otherwise project selection. Whether a work, crack is determining crack sealing or crack filling is needed. In other words, is, are the cracks working cracks? Or are they non-working cracks? And we'll explain the difference on those. We'll determine the payments high and low temperature extremes to help us figure out which what is the proper sealant for the application we're doing. And then we'll talk about project product selection, proper application and equipment. And then the, we'll talk about dealing with cracks that are too big for traditional crack sealing or crack filling. So why, why? Well, we wanna prevent water intrusion into the base and the sub base material when you get the base wet or the sub base wet you weaken the pavement we all know that and uh by limiting the amount of water that goes in there your road's going to stay stronger you're going to have less uh deterioration it also helps prevent the cracks getting filled with dirt incompressible so when it gets hot you get humps it improves ride quality and it slows down pavement deterioration. And I would tell you, if you're with an agency that has never done any preventative maintenance treatments and you're wanting to start your uh, pavement preservation preventative maintenance program, I would look at crack sealing and crack filling as your first deal to get started for a couple of reasons. One, it's very cost effective. And number two, it's very inexpensive. You can do a lot of roads with limited amount of resources or money. So I like this picture here. Uh, if you, this picture here, uh, I took this several years ago. I was heading up to meet with uh, one of MnDOT's district uh, maintenance engineers that was new to the job and didn't believe there was any need to seal cracks because he said, oh, water never runs into it. And so I'm driving up there, it's in March, it's a warm day, it's starting to melt. And if you look to the right side of the picture, that's uphill and the water's running from the median from the snow melt and coming right down to the crack and going into the crack. And I showed him that picture and I, I think it really changed his opinion on the need for crack sealing. So why crack seal? Well, cracks are gonna happen. According to the Federal Highway, they're inevitable and neglect leads to accelerated pavement, deterioration in potholes, further reducing the pavement uh, serviceability. And that's from a Federal Highways deal there. Why, with proper timing and with proper and timely application of crack sealing, crack filling can extend the life of the payment past the point where the cost benefit for added payment life exceeds the cost of the operation. Back when I was at MnDOT, there was always the question on whether we're doing crack sealing, crack filling, we're doing chip sealing, we're doing uh, microsurfing, we're doing thin lays, whatever is it cost effective? And so I sort of came up with a, a, a simple way to look at it. And you take the cost of new construction, if it's a new road, or if you did a mill and overlay, whatever your cost per square yard is, and then you figure out the estimated number of years that treatment's gonna last. So if it's new construction, and we're gonna say it's 30 years, and for easy math, 
and it costs thirty dollars a square yard, which I know you can't do new construction for that, but just for there. So it's our cost is a dollar per square yard per year for that road. If you just divide it evenly there, so then you look at your your treatments and uh, and you divide the cost of the treatment by how much life extension. So if we did crack sealing and let's say it cost us a uh, dollar a square yard, which would be really high. It's probably 20 cents a square yard or less depending on the number of cracks. And uh, let's say it extended the life of the pavement two years, our cost is 50 cents per square yard. So basically for that, uh, crack ceiling to be cost effective it's only got to extend the payment less than a year yeah or around a year and so it's very cost effective what track cr track cracks to treat well all cracks as soon as they appear any crack will allow moisture to penetrate into the pavement and the sub-basement. Now, realistically, if you've got a new road out there and it's 10 miles long and one crack appears, you're not gonna run out there and do that. But when you start to get a regular crack pattern, seal them as soon as possible. At the minimum, all cracks equal to or greater than an eighth of an inch. And one of my old bosses at MnDOT is retired now. He always said, well, we only, we only, uh, seal the uh, working cracks. And I'll explain what a working crack is, but being a smart aleck, I said to him, I said, so why wouldn't we seal the other ones? Well, cause he said, they don't move. And I said to him, well, how'd they get there? And he said, well, they moved and cracked. So anyhow, to me, you seal all cracks. There's different methods. So there's two different types of cracks. There's a working crack, which according to the Federal Highways is approximately 10% of the cracks. I, I don't know if that's right or not. And you use, you place a specialized treatment material. In other words, we're doing, doing a crack filling there on a working crack. And these are the cracks that move. And then a non-working crack, you can do a clean and seal or a blow and go because there's very little movement. So you don't need that reservoir, so. So working versus non-working. Working cracks have high movement greater than three millimeters between hot and cold weather. Up at International Falls, we was up there one time and you talk about wide cracks up at the International Falls Airport. Uh, they were landing big jets up there back at the time. And I literally could put my foot, it was in January, it was about 20 below zero, I could put my foot down in the cracks in that runway. So that was a high movement crack. They're normally thermal cracks. They're normally across your pavement there. Now, if you're dealing with a parking lot, you can have thermal cracks that go across the parking lot and they can also go long ways with the parking lot because you got a lot of mass there. Non-working cracks, low movement, very little movement if all. They're normally your longitudinal crack, like your paving seam. That little crack will appear there. There's a crack between the curb and gutter in your pavement. There can be block cracks as the pavement gets older. You know, it'll crack it. The thermal cracks will start out at 40 feet. And then you'll get an additional one, you know, in a few years at 20 feet. And they'll get down. And then pretty soon you'll start to get some longitudinal cracks and they'll actually make blocks. And then it also can be fatigue cracks. And these cracks have very little movement. And a lot of times they run parallel with the traffic. So they need to be clean and sealed rather than route and sealed. And we can talk about that a little more. So if we were doing this in uh, person right now, I would ask the question, how many of you folks do your own work there? And you can raise your hand. I can't see it, but it doesn't make any difference. And how many bit the work out? You know, there's, you know, those are the two categories. But if you're bidding the work out, there, your crack treatment workout, there's three methods to bid it. There's by the pound of sealant. In other words, 
you tell them they're going to do the these 20 blocks of city street or these 10 miles of county road or whatever and you pay for it by the amount of poundage it takes to uh fill it now when i was at mindot we would see somewhere between 30 and 40 percent overrun on the poundage and part of the reason was in order to let the project in march the february or march to try to get the best prices the plans and proposals had to go downtown to the central office somewhere first week in november latest the first week in december so if we went out and measured the cracks on a especially on a one or two year old overlay or a newer pavement we'd be, do, be doing that in october and we time they get ready to do the work there'd be one more whole winter so we'd gain a lot of cracks so there can be there can be a lot of overrun we've seen 30 to 40 percent overruns uh one other thing is if you've got an unscrupulous contractor and they're making money on their poundage they like to make the overbands wider and thicker which can cause a lot of issues plus it's just a waste of sealant in my opinion the other method is by the linear foot of cracks. And there again, you can have overrun because if you measure the cracks in the fall and you do the work the following spring, you got additional cracks. Uh, you need to really watch if you're doing a route and seal, we want it flush full, that they're doing a good job of filling it level and they're putting a the proper width overband and thickness on there because any pound of sealant they don't use is money they save. So I have one son and, and all those 11 grandkids and great grandkids. I've got one son and three daughters. And my son was working for, uh, uh, when he was in college, was working for a crack sealing contractor. And uh, of course he's 18, 19 years old and they're working someplace up in Northern Minnesota and they're they're, they've been into the local pub and he'd been drinking. And of course, any of you folks that have uh, sons will know that at some point in time in their life, they think they're smarter than you are, which they are. And he calls me up one night. Of course, I'm working for the state. So since he's working for a contractor, state guys are dumb, you know, and this and that. And I can tell he's been in the cops and he says, dad you guys are stupid and i said well yeah you're not the first person to tell me that and i said what's the deal and he said well we're on this crack sealing job there and he said you know if you pay us by the pound you know how much sealing a gopher hole holds and i said no and uh, i said well what about if we pay by linear foot he said well the inspector's not watching he said we cut cracks that don't exist i said oh really I said, boy, I hadn't thought of that. I said, why don't you ask your inspector tomorrow how you're getting paid and call me back? Well, he called me back the next day and he said, what's this road station deal? And I said, it's a hundred feet down the center of the road. You shall steal every crack from edge to edge there. And he said, why? And I said, well, do you know how much sealant a gopher hole holds? And he looked at me and he said, how do you figure that out? And I said, Jacob, this isn't my first rodeo. So anyhow, but, uh, but it's an interesting story there. So road station or if you're a city, uh, you can do it a uh, lump sum. But basically, there's no overrun. And I know for a lot of the cities, if you go to the city council and get a, a you let a project and get approval on the uh, on the bid prices for X amount of dollars, it's really a big hassle if they run over, you know, getting city council approval. So there's no overrun. It's easy to inspect. Uh, you just need to make sure they're doing quality work when they're doing it. And then as far as just reviewing the project and seeing that all cracks are sealed. So MnDOT adopted these facts back in 2000 or 2001. I, can't remember for sure when we wrote it. And the uh, first time we led it in an experimental spec, we took and we found three roads that had similar crack patterns, 
similar traffic levels. And uh, we uh, let one by the pound, one by the linear foot, and one by the road station. Well, when the bids came in, the road station bid was very high. And the other two were there. Well, when we did it at the pre-con, the same contractor got all three ones. We said, when you run out of poundage, you know, if we had 10,000 pounds of material, when you run out, you quit. On the linear foot, when you run out of feet, however many feet that was, 30,000 feet, 40,000 feet, whatever it was, you quit. And on the road station, you do the whole deal. Well, they did. And when we got back and we calculated the additional cost, even at the bid price, to complete the pound job or the linear foot job, guess which one was the cheapest? The road station. And I, like I say, I work for Aztec right now, and I know when they get a road station bid package right now, you're going to bid your street and it's by the road station or, or lump sum. They will literally go out and count the cracks so they know how many cracks there are and estimate the quantity of material. So it's just if you're going to bid one and you don't want any surprises, road station or by the block or whatever fits into your your locality is a good way to bid it sealant selection so there's hot pour and in the hot pour there's three categories there's crumb rubber there's a low modulus so crumb rubber is min dot 37 19 low modulus is min dot 37 23 and then whoops what did I hit? And you must have just hit the stop sharing by accident on the top. <laughs> oh, am I not sharing? Yeah, so if you could just share again. Okay. Uh, share screen. Share. Okay, is it back now? Yes, it is. Just go, you need to just go to the full. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Yep. Sorry about that. So, like I say, there's three categories. 3719 is crumb rubber, 3723 is, is low modulus, and 3725 is extra low modulus. And we'll talk about each one a little more there as we go through. Well, actually, now's, now's a good time to tell. So... When MnDOT pre-approves a crack sealant, and I would recommend that if you've got somebody doing crack sealing or crack filling, that you require them to use approved product from MnDOT on their approved product list. And what happens is Deary America, Craftco, BMAC, Meadows, uh, Nouveau, whoever's making the material will send a sample of the lot into the MnDOT chemical lab at Maplewood and they will test it. And one of the tests they do is a bond test where they have these specially developed concrete uh, blocks and they take and they pour the seal in a half an inch thick at the, after it's been heated at the proper temperature, proper amount of time per the uh, manufacturer's recommendation. They'll pour it between the blocks, let it cool down, and then they will put it in the freezer and they'll put it in a device that stretches it to see if it's able to adhere and if it's got enough uh, resilience to be able to stretch. So on crumb rubber, that half inch block, there it's put in the freezer to 24 hours at zero degree F and it's a half an inch. So in a 24 hour period, they stretch it out to three quarters of an inch back to a half, three quarters, back to a half, three quarters, three times. And as long as it stays uh, adhered to the concrete blocks and doesn't tear in it, it passes that part of the test. There's some other tests they run on there. The low modulus is a lower modulus, more relaxing, more able to stretch. So they pour that at a half an inch wide in those blocks, put it in the freezer for 24 hours at zero degrees F, and they go from a half an inch to an inch. In other words, with crumb rubber, they do a 50% extension 
on uh, low modulus of the 3723, they do 100% extension three times. So you can see it's a little, a little more flexible. It's able to move a little further. Now the extra low modulus of the 3725, same half an inch, but they put it in a 20 below zero F. So they go from zero degrees Fahrenheit to 20 below zero degrees Fahrenheit. And then they stretch it 200%. So they go from a half an inch to an inch and a half three times. So you can see it's a lot more flexible material. So, so that's what's the difference of three there. Some places they use emulsion and cutbacks. To me, what they're doing with that is they're just painting the, the faces of the uh, cracks. So, so you need to pack the best type of sealant for the method you're going to use. And you may need two types of sealants on a job, which is a pain in the butt. And the sealant needs to be tailored for the region. When 3725 first came out, or was the old Craftco 525 or 522, let me, excuse me. They made it first for South Dakota and the stuff really worked well. Well, then they started selling it all over the country and they had issues down in Arizona and stuff with it tracking. So then Craftco was one of the first companies that started to tailor their sealants for the region. So. We'll get over here on the, and craftco has got a really good website. I mean, uh, is it the best sealant? I don't know. I think they've all pretty good sealant, but they basically use the maps as you'll see on my screen there. The one on the lower left is the high temperatures and that's the predicted seven day high temperatures for the region in there. This is basically the maps that were developed by, uh, Federal highways for the PG grading and asphalt binder asphalt cement. And so you look here and up here in Minnesota, you'll see we're in the 50 of green. So we're in the 58 C. So that's our high temperature. And then on the low temperature, depending on where you're at, if you're south of the cities, it's uh, probably in the red or blue, uh, light blue, the darker blue is 34 C. So they now, a lot of the sealant manufacturers are starting to tailor the sealant. So when you call them up and you say, I want uh, Craftco 522 and I want it for Minnesota, it's going to be a, a softer on the bottom end, low temperature, and it's going to have a, a softer high temperature range. It's going to be more flexible than if you were working in southern Arizona in the desert the top number would be a lot stiffer and the bottom number would be also be stiffer because you don't see the temperature extremes. So the next thing you need to do is if you're gonna do a, a crack sealing job, and especially if you're bidding it by the pound or if you're buying the material for your own crews, you need to calculate approximately how much material you've got there. And this is just a screenshot I stole from Craftco once again, that gives you the width and the depth on the columns, and then uh, it gives you the gallons or feet per gallons. Let me correct that. So, so up here, if we were doing up here in the upper left, if we were doing basically clean and clean and seal an eighth inch by three eighths inch deep, a gallon of sealant would go 410 feet. If we're over here toward the middle, let's see, where's it at? Uh, my bifocals aren't working good today. Anyhow, okay, we go down here in the middle, and of course you can't see my finger. And I don't think you can see my mouse, but three quarter by three quarter, a gallon of sealant goes 34.2 feet. So, and then you put the number of feet of cracks, the, whoops, the crack footage, feet per gallon and they've actually got a calculator to calculate it for it but i'm going to walk us through one just because i think it's a good way to explain so let's say you got three thousand feet of cracks you're going to route them three quarter by three quarter so if we go back to that graph uh well first of all we need to know the weight of the sealant so off the box of sealant or off the material data sheet that the sealant suppliers have online 
if we find out the sealant weighs nine and a half pounds per gallon, and we from that chart that we showed a couple slides back, we find out that a gallon of this crack sealant will cover 34.2 feet at three quarter by three quarters. That's without a overband. That's just filling the reservoir. So 3,000 divided by 34.2 feet gives us 87.7 gallons needed. Uh, it weighs nine and a half pounds, so we're at 833 pounds. Uh, with overband, I would ask round that up to a thousand pounds. It just gives you uh, an idea. And I used to, before these charts were there, I always used to figure on a route and seal, three quarter by three quarter, they're going to run around three foot to a uh, pound of sealant. And that's about what this comes out, 3,000 feet, 1,000 pounds. So it comes out pretty close. But it's just a tool to look at. Claire, is there any questions or have I put everybody to sleep? I don't know about sleeping, but there's no questions in the chat right now. Okay, well, good. Well, we're going to go here about another 15 minutes or so, and then we're going to take a five-minute break because I'm an old man. I hope everybody <laughs> understands. So project selection. Remember I talked about block cracking or alligator cracking? Here's a good picture. So does it pay to crack seal this road here? No, it'd be a total waste. Uh, this is actually a picture the guy gave me from out in the desert where they get so much intense UV light that it just dries the pavements up. This is a picture I took. Uh, it's a uh, airport parking area for a small municipal airport. The uh, manager of the airport it called me up when I was a MnDOT and wanted to chip seal the uh, parking lot. Uh, he said that the contractors told him it wasn't a good candidate. I drove down and I looked at it and I told him, no, it's not a good candidate for a chip seal. And uh, it's also not a good candidate for crack sealing. Somebody did a lot of work here. I'm not sure that it was work well uh, spent. If there was cracks under each one of all that crack sealant and the guys or the people doing the work just weren't having fun, I would look at doing something like a scrub seal or some other treatment because the cost to put a surface treatment on and see what shadows through because they spent a lot of money and they also created a hazard for motorcyclists. Uh, that sealant there when it, on a hot day, it can, it can get pretty goosey. Here's another picture. Uh, I would not want to ride a motorcycle on that if uh, you know, there's, there used to be a deal where I could, Claire, where I could uh, make my mouse appear. I see your mouse. Oh, you do? Good. Yep. Okay. So if you're riding down the road, and this is a slight curve here, but if it's a, a sharp curve and that rear wheel's on that in a hot day, it'll scoot over, you know, and it, it scares you. And, and uh, back in the, oh boy, that was the early 90s, mid 90s, uh, there was a, a, a bay, a bay, that's the uh, motorcycle, uh, one of the motorcycle clubs. There's American Motorcycle Association, ABATE, and I don't remember what American bikers of whatever, but now ABATE was more the radical group of non Hells Angels, but they raised a lot of money for muscular dystrophy. And in Ohio, they were getting ready to have a big motorcycle rally, a uh, poker run, or whatever you want to call it, to raise money. And they took off. And one of the lead motorcyclists, the person riding it was inexperienced and hit a real wide. It was a foot wide, thick overband on a hot day. And the bike went down and they ended up killing eight motorcyclists that day. So I used to belong to AMA when I rode a lot, American Motorcycle Association. But Abate, they were a lot of lawyers, radical lawyers, what we used to call them. They ended up suing Ohio. 
they ended up in New York because New York did wide over bands like this. They got a moratorium and it almost killed the crack ceiling and crack filling business until the industry could show that they could maintain a narrow, thin over band. So it's just something, it's a waste of sealant and uh and it's can be a safety hazard on this one here it looks like it's almost in a wheel pass my gut feeling is that they had fatigue cracking and they're trying to hold it together uh i would have to look at the road but i would probably recommend that if it's in that case there that we put it in what i call hospice we just maintain the road until we can do a mill and overlay or something more uh proper because there so so here's a great candidate for a crack seal. You can see we've got nice, straight, uniform cracks across the road. We've got a little bit of edge cracking. So if I was doing this project here, this would be routed and sealed here, and this would be a clean and seal here. Here's a great candidate. This was actually part of a test deck that when I was at MnDOT, we put down to test different brands of sealants. And... Uh, you can see the nice there. So what what is wrong with this one picture here? I'll give you guys and gals a couple minutes to look at it. Look where this guy's standing. He's on the wrong side of the cones on the interstate. And uh, I don't know if you folks know it, but I when I worked at WSB, I was involved in a up on 94, one of my coworkers got uh, killed and I got banged up, not bad, but and uh, there, but we did everything right. If this guy uh, would end up getting hit and killed during the ocean investigation, somebody would pay heck for doing that. So just please be careful. If you get nothing else out of this whole class today, don't do what this person's doing here because. He's not paying attention to traffic. Look where his eyes are at. And look where the cones are at. And look where he's standing. And there's a semi just went by. So, but anyhow, this is a great candidate, the road itself to do there. So next thing we're going to talk is you've got a good candidate project and we're going to talk about equipment. So one of the common piece of equipment on a route and seal is a router. You need a melder. One of the best things I've seen come in the last in my career is these loading conveyors. And so if you're a city or a county, you've got your own melders and you don't have that and you're throwing blocks in by hand, look at these. If you're getting ready to buy a new melder, spec it with this conveyor on it. Because what's nice is you got the truck up here hooked up to it and you just put unbox the blocks or if you're using the styrofoam blocks put them on there and then you got to switch you bump them and you're not having to stand there and dump them in there and i've seen people on the old kettles where we used to dump them in stuff and splash out and luckily nobody got burnt real bad you need some sort of air compressor and we're going to talk about that a little more and a heat lamp so that's a pretty common equipment so now we'll talk about the two methods. Crack filling is what we used to call the old blow and go or clean and seal. And then there's crack sealing. That's where we're going route in the reservoir and we're trying to seal the reservoir year round. With the crack filling, we realize if it's a highly moving crack, that it's going to crack in the wintertime, but it's going to heal back up in the summertime. And we get most of our moisture from now until next uh, November. So, so crack fillings, usually non-working cracks, longitudinal cracks. You do not want to route longitudinal cracks, especially if they're in the wheel path. I have literally seen, if you can see my hands, on uh, US 52, there was an area where they did a route and seal with low modulus 3723 sealant in the wheel path. And the routed reservoir ended here. 
and the sealant had been pushed down six, seven feet past it. And I've got a non-digital picture someplace of it. So it's like a rolling pin. It just keeps working the material down and you risk picking up the sealant and longitudinal cracks if you route them. Tom, we have and, a quick question in the yep, chat. Yep. Sorry to interrupt. So Dan asked what PPE is needed to meet the silica dust standard? That's an excellent question. And I and I I cannot answer that question. I would uh, I would talk to the router manufacturers because I know they went with HIPAA filters and they've done a bunch of stuff. Uh, I would talk with an industrial hygienist. Hygienist, I think they are the, there because that's not my area of, of expertise. So I'm sorry I can't answer that. That's a good question. If we were in class, you'd win a candy bar. Is there a follow up or not? Nope, no follow up. Okay. Part of the reason, because the longitudinal cracks don't work, they're non working. The other thing is, even if it's a working crack, if you get to where the crack spacing or your transverse cracks are less than 20 feet, you start to route them, your cost is going to be so prohibitive. Plus, every one of them routed reservoirs is going to make a little bit of a bump. And so if, if ride is critical for your uh, the public, you know, it's probably better just to do a clean and seal. And then a lot of people, if they're doing a thin overlay, like an inch and a half overlay, there's a group that says don't route it three quarter of an inch because you're routing half the mix off. Uh, that never bothered me as much personally, but uh, there is a group that says thin overlays there. And then it says properly applied sealants can last six to eight years. I agree with there that if you get you do a good job of cleaning it and adhes and good good adhesion, it's going to be there for six to eight years. How long is it uh, functioning as slowing water infiltration? That's a little more subjective and a little harder to determine. Uh, parking lots, really not a big fan of routing parking lots, especially three quarter by three quarter, because when you put that low modulus ceiling in there and if somebody walks in their heel goes into that reservoir you can cause a trip hazard and at the bare minimum you break off the heel off of an expensive pair of shoes or somebody falls and breaks an ankle or trips and falls like i did last year and breaks my wrist it's not good what i recommend if any of you folks are going to be building a new parking lot or repaving a parking lot is to go in when you put the base course down and do a single saw cut one third of the way through the base course. So you're paving an inch and a half, saw it a half an inch, and then put your wear course on it. And then the cracks will come, they'll reflect through because you've created a weak plane for the crack, the pavement the crack, and they'll be nice and straight. And I would lay the cracks out in the areas where you have the least amount of pedestrian traffic you know, maybe it's up, uh, if, uh, if it's head to head parking and you're gonna have a line, a painted line, you know, to mark the parking deals, you put it there. And uh, usually you end up, the goal is 30 to 40 foot blocks because on a parking lot, you not only have expansion and contraction long ways like we have on a road, but they get so wide that you have it crossways. And if you don't, control the cracks in a parking lot based off my experience you'll end up with a few cracks that are really wide and are really hard to deal with so and then recreational trails there again if you end up routing three quarter by three quarter transverse cracks rollerbladers are going to cause a, a bump for them and can be a trip hazard and if you got a crack running down longitudinally and when they're pushing off this way with their rollerblade and i've never rollerbladed and they catch that it can be an issue so i would just do a clean and fill so here's a clean and fill. this is a good candidate crack for doing a clean and fill there uh, they clean the cracks out with compressor 
the air compressor needs to have a water trap and an oil trap or an air dryer and a oil trap on it because we don't want to blow moist air into the cracks. You need to come along with a heat lance and the heat lance does not dry the cracks. What the heat lance does is any dust, excuse me, any dust that uh, you can't blow off with the uh, air compressor, it, if it's asphaltic dust, it'll melt it, it'll make it tackified. So you just a real fast pass. It conditions the edges. They're 14 to 1800 degrees F, so be careful running them. Uh, don't burn the pavement. It helps to remove dirt and it helps to make the, the edges a little sticky because it starts to soften the asphalt just a little bit there. It does not dry wet cracks. Whether you're doing a route and seal or a clean and seal, if you've got a damp crack and you hit it with a heat lance and you dry it to where it's dry, which means you heated it up, as soon as that heat goes away, the moisture outside the zone that you heated is going to be wicked into what you've heated because it's trying to get equilibrium. So, so it's you can't dry it with a heat lance. Here's an example where they're doing a filling of the crack. They're using a, a nipple on the wand and they're following with a squeegee and they're doing a nice, neat crack. If you go back and look at that slide before, this is that uh, same crack, crack filled. And you can see a nice, neat two, two and a half inches wide. Keep that overband 16th of an inch thick, force that sealant down into the cracks. So recommendations for clean and seal, it needs to be structurally sound pavement, dry pavement and dry cracks. So it rained last night, crack sealing crew or your crew wants to get out and go crack sealing, the sun's out, which it's not today, but if it was and the road dries up, the surface of the road dries up, seven o'clock in the morning, you're gonna go crack sealing or crack filling. No, because the last thing to dry on the road is the crack. That's where the moisture went. So there, you need to remove all vegetation, clean, loose dirt and debris from the cracks. Try to work when the cracks are open. Up here in Minnesota, that's sort of hard to do, but they're neat, thin overbands. No more than three inches wide. Two and a half inches wide is probably better. If you get too wide and you decide to do an overlay, you can have issues with the Overlay above slipping and causing bumps in your new overlay. Fill with proper sealant, uh, hot pours. The two sealants for clean and fill would be crumb rubber. Crumb rubber is more forgiving. It sticks there, but like I said, it's less elastic. It's going to not stay sealed as well as, as low modulus. So. Emulsion, some parts of the country, they use CRS2 or CRS2P for the emulsion. Uh, cutbacks, M3250, you know, just to paint the deal. So. And here's just an example of filling a longitudinal crack. Now, I don't know whether this is what this is up here, so we're not going to call the safety out. But look how he's got the cone set out there. He's forced them over on the, there, this is a, four lane divided road. He's doing the center longitudinal joint on his first pass where he can push traffic over on the wider right shoulder. I would give them a good rating for their safety because they're, they're thinking because you could easily do the right lane first and want to do the center line, and, but you can't push traffic over as far as you can when you got the right lane. So use the layout and geometry of your street or road to be able to work the safest as possible. Like I say, filling lines do cracks, very little movement, uh, keep sealant to the width of the minimum. Uh, we talked about this safety issue for uh, motorcycles. Don't use extra low modulus uh, back. Oh boy, I'm guessing it was 2002, 2001. Uh, MnDOT led a big project in the metro to do a crack sealing project. A contractor, out-of-state contractor, got the work. Uh, 
We had a labor dispute, so most of the inspectors at MnDOT were out on strike. Uh, I was actually up in the Iron Range area inspecting crack sealing and the grading job. Um, 35W north of Johnson, north of the 35W bridge were asphalt pavement. I think it's been repaving concrete now, but uh, route and seal, we didn't know any better. We, we two minutes over concrete, we routed transverse cracks. They routed the longitudinal paving seams uh night work it was too cold uh that next april first week in april we got some 90 degree day the some of the whoops some of the longitudinal sealant started to come loose uh the average speed at three o'clock in the afternoon on the 35w is probably eight ten mile an hour the catalytic converters reliquified the sealant it started to pick up on the car tires. Uh, I think there was 200 or 250 cars we had to buy new tires for because a, a front wheel drive car, the rear tires got so filled up with crack sealant that they wouldn't turn. Uh, it was a two year old level five super pave mill and overlay. Uh, we ended up doing an emergency mill and overlay in April to remove the sealant. That's the reason why we don't do longitudinal because the transverse cracks were fine when we did the forensics on it. The problem started with the longitudinals came, some of them came loose, got picked up, and then they got the tires sticky and then it started pulling everything. So big issue. We also, the other thing we did wrong is we used extra low modulus sealing in that. And that's only for transverse cracks. Okay, it's 8.22 by my clock. Let's take five minutes. We'll be back at 827. There. That's all right, Claire. Yep, that's fine. Yep. Tom, we do have several questions in the chat, but you can address them when we're back from the break. Perfect, perfect.
Okay, folks. Uh, hope everybody's back. Claire, you said we got some questions. We do. Um, so let me start with Derek's question. He asked, if you can only use one sealant for route and seal and clean and seal, which would you use? It would be, it will be seal coated within a month. Okay, excellent question. I would use the low modulus, the 3723. Uh, it's a good compromise sealant. Uh, it's, it, in the routed areas, it, uh, it'll give you the expansion and contraction similar to the low, extra low modulus, but it's a little more forgiving. And then when you go into clean and seal areas, it, it's lower viscosity than the 3719 crumb rubber. So it'll flow down better and do a better job of painting the faces. And then my experience is with, when you put the chip seal on within a month, that's, that's, makes your crack sealing and crack filling perform a lot better. Back when I first started in the lab back in 98, working on preventive maintenance, uh, we did a lot of crack sealing, crack sealing or route and seal with two year warranty. And my job was to go out in February and review the sealant to make sure it performing. And I can't remember one project where if it was routed and sealed and then it was chip sealed the same year that ever met the failure criteria, I, the regular up uh, straight up uh, route and seals that weren't chip sealed, yeah, we had some failures that we had to address. Excellent question. Next one, Claire. So the next one's from Andrew and he asked, do you recommend filling route and sealed cracks in a two-step application, fill three-fourths of the crack in the first pass and then a fourth of the crack in the second pass. Andrew, exactly. I, I, when, in, when we're coming into the crack sealing or route and sealing section, that's one of the things I was going to bring up. I've got some slides showing it. And the reason why you do that is if you try to fill that reservoir completely in one go if you got any crown in the road in other words you got a cross slope of one five or two oh the sealant's going to roll or run out before it cools out to the edge and it's going to spill over and then it's going to be low in the center so we'll cover that excellent question okay next one is from rich he asks craftco and maxwell also make some sealants for wide cracks what are your thoughts on those types of products and the process used to pour to hot pour fill wide cracks? Excellent question. We're, we're gonna have a section on dealing with just with excellent, uh, with wide cracks. So Rich, we'll revisit that at that time, if that's fine with you guys. Okay, we have two, two more questions. So Jamie asked, would you also clarify material selection on temperatures? I recall a pavement temp threshold being used between 3719 and 3723. Three seven two five. What? Read that again. I... Would you also clarify material selection on temperatures? I recall a pavement temp threshold being used, and he just stated a range. Is, uh, I wonder if he's talking about the temperature of the sealant. If you do that, you'll get that off the box or the material there. As far as the sealants, picking the proper sealant for your region, you know, uh, you look at the, uh, the uh, LTPP temperature maps that I showed from Craftco on that. But basically, if you're buying the sealant from whomever's selling it, just tell them you want the sealant that's designed for our region. Okay. I and guess, then, Tom, just for clarity, this is Jamie. Um, yeah. If we were to go out crack sealing in the middle of winter and the pavement temperature is 20, you know, it's yeah. like two weeks of dry, we would use, my understanding, we would use a maybe a different product versus if it's uh, March and the pavement temperatures are warmer and it's dry, we might select a different uh, material. That's kind of what I was getting at in that question. Now you're, okay, okay, I didn't understand. So you're doing, 
Yeah. Uh, clean and fill, right? Tom, I think you're getting a little in the frozen. winter time. I'm frozen. Yeah, just for a second. Okay, can you try talking again? Okay. Yeah. So the question I had for Jamie is you're not doing route and seal, you're doing a clean and seal, right? Correct. Just blow and go. Yep, blow and go. Uh, and you're using the hot pour, you're not using the emulsion or uh, MC, or are you using the cutback? Uh, uh, like an MC3000 or MC250. Whatever you'd recommend. What? I guess, what do you recommend for the different temperatures? Um, you know, if we're doing it at 20 degrees versus 40. If I, if I was cracks filling or clean and seal in the, any time in the winter time before we've had a, a lot of rain to wash the salt dust out of the faces of the cracks, I would be looking at a 3719, a crumb rubber based material. And the reason why I would do that is it's more forgiving. And the crumb rubber is when it's cold after it's been placed, it's not very temperature sensitive as far as hot temperature, you know, getting sticky or anything. But I would be a little concerned with using a, a 3723 product that time of year because uh, even though it's been dry for a couple of weeks, there's a lot of salt dust or could be a lot of salt dust in the cracks that you can't get out. And I want something that it, it, it would adhere. And I understand, and I used to, when I was a maintenance supervisor, we used to crack fill in the winter time. And the problem here in Minnesota is really when we need to be doing it is in, we need to have a perfect March where the cracks are still open, but we've had rain to wash them out and then it's gotten dry. And that happens about once every 50 years. So. It's all a compromise. So I'm going to, uh, Jamie, my contact information's on the slide there. If you want to call me and we can discuss it a little further because I'm still a little bit confused uh, uh, on the question and it's my fault. So, well, no, you answered it, Tom. I, yeah. When it's colder, that's what I recall too, that we would use a 3719. Yep. It moves into March and preferable. In that ideal situation, we'd probably go to 3723. So I think exactly, you have yeah, yep, yeah. exactly. So well, thank you, Claire. The next question. Your final question is from Tim, and it, he asked, "Do you recommend the use of toilet paper, soap, or other method after application?" Uh, yes, and we'll be covering that here in a few slides. So the, all the questions are excellent and stuff. So. So let's move on. Now we're going to go to crack sealing. And what we're doing with crack sealing is we're trying to seal the crack by creating a reservoir to where it's sealed year round. In a perfect world, we'd, we'd cut the reservoir, we'd clean it perfectly, we'd put the perfect sealing in it, we'd do everything perfect. And 24 7, 365 days a year, no matter what the temperature's hot or cold, that crack would be sealed. Does it happen? Yeah, but it's, it's, you'll have some failures. So it's normally on working cracks, uh, being there's a lot of labor involved with routing and prepping the cracks and stuff. Like to see the cracks facing 20 feet or better. In other words, we're gonna be doing this on a newer pavement. There, uh, properly applied. The federal highway said it, the seal can last six to eight years. One research project that I never got to do was to do a long-term study. And what I wanted to do was I wanted to take a mile of road and not crack, treat it, take another mile of road on the same road, do a, a route and seal or crack sealing, and then another mile do clean and go. And then I wanted to look at the ride because MnDOT runs their, their uh, pavement rating vans over the road every year. And I wanted to look at the ride characteristics between the control section, the rod and sealed section, and the 
clean and fill or blow and go section and see how over 10 years the ride would uh, be affected. Because everybody there and everybody's tried to build devices to measure how well sealed the cracks are to moisture. And me being a simple man, I said, okay, the concept is if it's sealed, we don't let water into the pavement, the road doesn't get rougher. Therefore, if you use ride with the laser measurements, if the sealants, whether it's clean and seal or, or route and seal is, is helping, you should see a difference between that and the control section. But I could never get uh, anybody on board. And part of the problem was I knew I was in within two or three years of retiring when I came up with the idea. So uh, used on highway streets. In parking lots, be very careful. Go back to the sealant selection. If you absolutely have to route and seal a parking lot, talk to your sealant supplier and see what they have for parking lot sealants. They, some of them make a sealant that is stiffer to stand pedestrian traffic. And then res on a recreational trail, if I was gonna, since they're, most of them are nine or 10 feet wide, if I was gonna route them, it'd be only a three eighths inch wide rod. I'd just be trying to nick the walls to clean them up. Prepared reservoir, so route, and the two options are routing or sawing. Michigan used to do a lot of sawing. It does the same thing as routing. I actually like routing better than sawing because it's easier to follow the random cracks. So reservoir size and shape. Well, in Minnesota and upper Midwest, most states use a one-to-one -one ratio. In other words, the depth and the width of the reservoir you create are equal. Most commonly used is three-quarter by three-quarters or up uh, in the St. Louis County and up in the Canadian border area, they do a lot of one by one just because they get so much colder and they want more sealant to be able to stretch further. The Canadians, and I don't know whether they're still doing it because I haven't talked to anybody up in Winnipeg there, but they did a four to one. In other words, they went an inch and a half wide by three eighths inch deep. Now you think about it, when you got a three quarter by three quarter, you've got so much sealant there to be able to move. When you go to an inch and a half by three eighths, you've got a lot more sealant that can move this way. So it actually probably performs better in the cold weather, but the biggest issue is every one of those cracks is slap, 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 slap. We tried it at MnDOT and it was not acceptable to the traveling public. So there again, engineering wise, probably the best is a wide shallow reservoir, like an inch and a half wide by three-eighths or half as far as performance, but if the public doesn't like it, you can't do it. So that's the reason why MnDOT recommends a one-to-one -one ratio of three-quarter by three-quarter or inch by inch. Overbands perform the best. There's been numerous studies showing the overband. And if you can see my hand, the overband doesn't need to be white. So here's the reservoir on this side here. It just needs to come up around that corner, you know, and what that does is it sort of helps hold it there. So, and they need to be flush filled. So if you look at this slide here on the left, that's a standard reservation flush filled. The middle one B is a standard with a, what they call it a band-aid or overband. I would like to see that overband thinner, 16th of an inch, basically as tight as you can squeegee it on there. And then the C is the Canadian uh, four to one ratio. Best time of year to work. Uh, here they're showing if you're working in the wintertime and we look here at the left, it's perfectly flat in the wintertime, slightly humped up when the cracks are closed in the spring and the fall. In the summer, it's humped up real bad. Here they talk about doing it in uh, spring and fall in the winter time it's cupped down uh in the spring and fall it's flat and then it's slightly humped up and then the bottom one is the summer work it's going to be really low in the winter time low in there 
So it's, you know, at Aztec, we crack seal year round, or not year round, but all summer because that's to get the work done. That's what it has to be. My position is, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to do it when the cracks are open in the spring for that week or two. They're open early in the spring and the roads are clean and dry. And that week or two in the fall, when the road, the cracks have already opened back up, but we haven't got any de-icing chemicals in them and they're clean and dry there. But realistically, if you can only do X amount of roads during those periods of time and you've got X times 10 of the roads there, do it whenever you can do it because even if it's not optimum, having the cracks filled or sealed is better than not treating it all in my opinion. So routers, they need to center them over the over the crack. Uh, they need to be real careful and they need to check the router bits and let's see here. And here's just an example of a router there and there's I think there's six shafts I've been a while since look at neither carbate tips and they're freewheeling and then they to do your reservoir they space them with wash whoops back up they space them with washers so if these router bits or at least ones I've seen are from here to here or three eighths of an inch so if you want three quarter inch on one on one wheel you put it on this side with more washers on this side and less on that. The next one, you flip them around so that they cut three quarters of an inch wide. And actually when I used to inspect, I would tell them to set them up to start out at, at uh, over three quarter by three quarter because as the router bits wear, the corners get rounded in and you lose depth real fast. They end up, instead of being flat like this, they end up being shaped like that. Center them over the cracks, do a good job there. I like the way this guy's working. Live traffic is over here on this side of the road. He's pulling the router back toward the shoulder where he's got uh, free area. Yeah, another good picture of it. Check your depth. If you're doing it with your own forces, or if you're inspecting, just go get, if you're doing three quarter by three quarter, get a piece of three quarter inch bar stock and weld a handle onto it. And because I don't like bending over, I need to do more bending over for wellness. But, but you take that, you drop it in the reservoir and you can scrape out the loose stuff with, it. you know, drop it in the reservoir. And if you put your foot on top of it and you can feel this plate above it they're not deep enough or else the the router bits are starting to round over and if they're rounded over they can switch them from side to side to get more wear out of them here's just a nice job of routing the crack here's a crack with a lot of debris on it you need to clean all that debris off you need to move it away from traffic uh min dot spec does not allow uh vacuum or leaf blowers for final cleanup they can use it to move the do the preliminary cleanup but then they need to come back with a uh, air compressor and clean the crack out as you can see in this picture do a good job of cleaning it out there blow the debris out with air compressor once again they need to have an air dryer and oil traps uh condition the faces of the reservoir with a heat lance and on a route and seal the heat lance is, to me is really critical because you can take an air compressor and you can blow and blow and blow on that rotted reservoir and you take your fingers and you'll feel a fine grit there and what that is is that sand and asphalt from the where the cutters cut it when you run that heat lance along it you any asphalt that's in that fine dust gets liquefied i call it almost making it like a tack and then you put the hot pour in it and it it adheres a lot better in my opinion don't burn the pavement and here's just an example where they're they're doing the cleanup with the air compressor 
another nut picture of a nice clean there here they got a air compressor out front and this contractor's got a, a heat lance in the back so now let's talk a little bit about melders because we really haven't talked about them. whoops sorry about that so excuse me i'm getting ahead of myself so down here they're they're blowing it out and they're doing the heat lance and right behind it they're coming with the cattle so when we go to melt the sealant we need to follow the manufacturer's recommendation. So this box here is a BMAC or BRAM 190. So minimum temperature is 365. Recommended pouring temperature is 383. So what temperature should we apply it? To me, you should be applying around that 383. I used to argue with the sealant manufacturer and they'd have a minimum and maximum and a recommended pouring temperature. And I'd say, well, if you put a minimum down, that's where it's going to get poured, especially if a contractor is trying to get a lot of work done. And uh, to me, you need to be as close to that recommended temperature as possible, measured at the end of the wand. The other thing you need to look at is how long you can keep it at that recommended pouring temperature and how many times you can heat it up to that temperature and then let it cool down. So let's say yesterday it, wasn't, it didn't rain or we didn't think it was gonna rain, the roads were dry and we're gonna go out there as a maintenance crew and we heat the, heat the melder up, get her up the temperature and uh, and then all of a sudden we get out on the road, it rains. Okay, so we let it cool off. It rained today, it rained tomorrow. Thursday is a nice day. We heat it back up again. And then something happens and we cool it down. There's only so many times you can cycle it before you start to destroy the polymers and all the stuff that makes the sealant work. So you need to follow your uh, heating cycles. Watch that. And how long? Because you can cook the polymers off on there. I like to see the temperature taken at the end of the wand uh, because that's a true deal. So you'll have to let it flow a while, recirculate the wand back into the tank to get the wand warmed up and stuff there. The other thing is MnDOT also samples the material for field samples out of the end of the wand. Here's just another uh, example of a box material there. And I haven't done a lot of work with the uh, uh, boxes that are made out of styrofoam or whatever that you just throw them in there. I think the product's fine. I, when I was at MnDOT, I kept telling them, how are we going to put lot numbers because and everything on there? Because, oh, that's what I wanted to talk about on here. So on this box right here, here's your lot number, B12618. So... You would call the MnDOT lab and say, hey, I got some Deary American uh, 101 ELT. And then you give them the, the lot number and they'd tell you it's been tested and it passed. Or if it hadn't been tested, then you would tell the contractor to be up to you as an agency if you want to let them work uh, subject to the sealant passing the test or however you want to handle that. So. So sealant recommendations, no direct fire melders. I'm old enough to remember when at MnDOT, we used to have the old uh, tar kettles that we melted AC3 roofing flux in them. And every year somebody would burn one up, but not, you know, cause they were direct fired flumes and they had to heat that old AC3 up to about 425, definitely above the flash point. Uh, needs to have some sort of mixer in the tank so you keep the material moving so it's homogeneous. Uh, it needs temperature controls on the transfer oil since they're not direct fired and also on the finished product. And then it needs a sealant temperature gauge. I strongly recommend a heated hoses. They save a lot of headaches and a flow control on the wand so the operator can control how much it flows. 
I remember when some of the new ones first came out back probably 88, 89. I know we demoed one where it didn't, uh, and I can't remember what brand it was, whether it was Bearcat or whatever, but, but they didn't have a valve on the end of the wand. So you had to have a person stand there at the machine opening and shutting the valve for the person pouring it. And that was sort of a disaster. They need to be able to back suck the hose into the tank. They also need to have a, a way to be able to stick the nozzle. If you're going a long ways down the road, stick it into the tank and uh, recirculate back through the tank. Here's just an example of uh, uh, one uh, method of measuring the material temperature. I have a little issue with these. This is a, a thermometer. They got a pipe that goes through the transfer oil into the into the tank, so the thermometer can go into the tank without touching. You know, it's inside a a pipe there, so it doesn't get all gooey and stuff. Well, the problem is where it goes through that transfer oil, that thermometer will pick heat up from there. So that's the reason why when I was at MnDOT, we tested the temperature at the end of the wand with infrared gun. Here's just some of the controls and stuff. So, so one of the questions was about double fill. So here's an example of a single fill, flush fill, looks pretty good. And here's what you end up with. You see how it sagged and how it puddled off there. And this was part of the research uh, test deck uh, that MnDOT built to uh, try different sealants and uh, different methods stuff. So, so definitely a big fan of double fill. So double fill, you come through like the questioner said before, you fill the bottom half, two thirds full. Uh, if you got two kettles on the job, you space them out three or four minutes apart so that bottom lift or bottom sealant can start to cool. And then you come back and put the surface on it and you end up with a nice flush, narrow overband and a flush fill. Needs two kettles. Uh, like I said, the first fills reservoir half, two thirds full, three quarters full, allow to cool. And then the second finishes up. Uh, my experience in working and in inspecting several in, uh, different contractors is you're going to get better production with the two cattle method if you can uh, do it because that front cattle is going to put out half, two thirds, or probably two thirds of the sealant that day. And so as that cattle starts to run down, you switch them. You know, so you can always keep the kettles full and hot. So recommendations, keep recycling sealing into the kettles between cracks. Don't let it dribble on the road. Uh, one of the guys that I work with right now that's uh, in charge of all the crack sealing years ago, and Dougie will get mad at me, but years ago there was a project they did in the Metro and and it was a night job, and I don't know what the problem was, but man, there was dribbles. The inspector called me up, and it was just every crack, between every crack, it was just dribble and dribble and dribble and dribble. And so we had a few words about it. It, it went away. Need to be thin over bands, no more than three quarter an inch wider than the reservoir on each side. So if I'm doing a three quarter inch reservoir, we're looking at two and a quarter, two and a half inches, three inches, no wider than that for the overband. We have a Less quick question. Yep. Um, sorry, from Dave, who asked, what is your opinion on the use of rope foam for deep cracks? Oh, the backer? Uh, if they're really deep and... Uh, yeah, you can do that if you're hiring it done, the cost gets where it's almost cheaper to fill them with sealant. Uh, Dave, is, are these cracks real wide cracks or are they just, because uh, most all the cracks go all the way through the pavement, you know, whether we're routing them and, 
And if they're just, you know, one that you could do, you know, they're under three quarter of an inch wide, uh, I would just route them and just fill them because the sealant cools off so fast going down in there, it's gonna dam up. But if they're like an inch, inch and a half wide to where you're just gonna empty your kettle filling them, then I would look at a backer, or I'd look at the mastics that we're gonna talk about later. that answer the question for you, David? You said thank you. Okay. So this is cohesion of, of failure. Cohesion of failure is where the sealant, remember when I talked about how we test the sealant? And so on those concrete blocks, it stayed adhered to the concrete blocks, but it tore in the sealant. So this would be a lack of uh, ductility. Uh, it's resilient modulus was too high. It, 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 it tore there. I have literally seen sealants that were very good at sticking to the asphalt when you did a route and seal, but were so stiff that when it got cold and such a strong sealant that they ended up creating another crack in the asphalt because they were stronger than the asphalt. So, so this is cohesion failure. And the reason why I bring these up is so people know. So then if you call me up and say, hey, Tom, I got a crack sealing job out there and I'm having failure, I'm gonna say, is it cohesion failure? Is it, it the cracking in the sealant? Or is it adhesion failure? Where, as you can see here along the edge, it's not sticking to the pavement. Because if it's cohesion failure, it's probably a sealant selection or a sealant material issue. If it's adhesion failure, it's probably workmanship or the rock. I mean, of all the things I worked on at MnDOT, you know, I think the chip seal spec is a, a good spec. It works well. The microsurfacing spec and a bunch of the cold in place recycling and all that. Crack sealing was one area where I could never find the silver bullet to where 99.9% .9 of the time, everything went right. And part of the problem is you've got aggregates, you get down the Mankato area, they got some of the court sites that have a stripping issue. So the sealants probably need to have an anti-strip. Uh, you got shale in some places. I mean, you got all different types of mineralogy in our hot mix. And then you got the quality of the cruise, the weather, the time of year. I mean, there's so many variables and stuff. And, and I would say if, if, when I finally do retire, the one frustration I'd have is I think we improved the crack sealing, crack filling process, but did we get it to where it's as good as it can be? No, and that's, and that's a failure on my part. So the question was before do toilet paper or or uh, detackifier. Here's an example of dealing with traffic. Uh, um, I just realized this is a routed longitudinal crack. I'm going to have to yell at the guy that gave me the picture. But here they're using the de uh, detack uh, fire. Uh, the most of the sealant manufacturers make a product for that. I've heard of people mixing soapy water up and doing the same thing. Um, if I was going to use a liquid system, I would probably buy the detackifier from the sealant manufacturer. Not saying it's better than soapy water, but if you have a failure and you think it's a material failure and you go back to the sealant guy manufacturer and you're out there meeting and one of the questions they're going to ask you is what did you do to protect it from traffic? And if you use, said you use soapy water or something they didn't approve, they're going to say, well, there's the reason why the problem may not be the reason why, but that's what they're going to use for an excuse. So, so here's the detacking agent and it works well. Uh, to me, I like the toilet paper. The job ain't done until the paperwork's done. And uh, one of the things I've seen with toilet paper, if you're uh, like, if you're on a curb with a high super and you're doing a, double fill and you're still having trouble with it sagging 
if you keep the toilet paper right up against the wand putting the material on, this toilet paper will actually help hold the sealant in place. You know, it acts like a little fiber reinforcement. And so I've actually seen that done on, like on curves with a lot of super elevation in them and stuff. So something to look at. So I've talked several times about the road needs to be clean and dry. So here's a contractor out there and he said, well, the rain's over. We're gonna go ahead and crack seal. And this was actually part of this test deck. So you can see this is a crack 6.2. And we told him, you're crazy. So he's filling it. And here's what the sealant looked like afterward. Can you see all the bubbles? Well, what you have to remember is water, when it turns from a liquid to steam, expands depending on where you're at in the state, somewhere around 1,690 to 1,700 times. So a drop of water the size of a pinhead will be huge. Rochester Airport, back, oh, this must have been, because I was still riding the 98 Harley because I wrote it down there. So this must have been 2000 or 2001. Uh, did taxiway, and then they have 707s coming in, bringing people in the Mayo Clinic. Started picking the sealing up. It was a route and seal in the taxiway area and the parking for the big planes. And so we went down to look at it, and sure enough, they'd done double fill, and you could literally pull the top sealing off the bottom. And we're digging around and we're pulling and all of a sudden we're finding little puddles where there's little bits of water laying between the sealants. And so we got talking to the, the uh, airport manager and he said, well, yeah, he said the contractor went and routed all the cracks, blew them out real good and went around and filled all of them. Half, two thirds full, three quarters full with the first pass. They got about a five minute hard rain waited for it to dry up, went and put the overband on. Well, as soon as he told me that, I knew what happened. There was a little bit of moisture laying on top of that bottom <coughs> layer of sealant. When they put the hot stuff on there, it created a layer of steam that kept them from bonding together. And then you bring in those big jet airplanes, and those tires are hot, and they got on it, and they pulled it up. And so they ended up doing a mill and overlay to fix it. So road needs to be dry. It needs to be clean success so how many folks got curb and gutter so to me the curb and gutter is one area where you really need to seal between the curb and the gutter we actually did a uh, research project out at min road where uh many years ago where we have uh they have edge drains under each one of the 500 foot sections, and they have tipping buckets on the outlet so they can measure this is the. Cody, floor. I'm giving you a call from the dealer service center. We recently noticed. Yeah, my warranty's up. Uh, measure the outflow on that. So we had concrete pavement with asphalt shoulder. So it's backwards of a street where you got asphalt with concrete curb. And so we went and we sealed that joint there and then we took and we and of course they got a weather station up there when we took and we looked at several rain events before and after that were similar intensity and similar duration and we compared the amount of tipping bucket tips and we reduced the flow through the edge drains by about 80 to 85 percent so in other words that water was coming over that off that pavement and hitting that crack between out in the shoulder and going down versus going off the road. And so to me on the curb and gutter, it's the same thing. So, so uh, Lee Gustafson that used to be with Minnetonka and I, we came up with the idea. We liked the idea of doing that over there, but we were talking about joint adhesive and joint adhesive was a special sealant made for cold seams paving. And we said, let's try it, put it on the concrete curb face and then paving up against it. And that's what this picture is. This is a four or five year old joint adhesive on there. And you can see how pliable it is and it seals it all the way down. So when I was at WSB, 
that became our standard procedure was if you do a mill and overlaying curb and gutter or do new construction, you put the joint adhesive between the asphalt and the curb to reduce the deal. This is actually with that test section uh, or doing a curb and gutter up at Men Road on there. So just another, another one. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop the water from going down in this crack. Because what happens in the spring of the year, the streets start to melt, the icing chemical goes down in that crack, it starts to thaw the underlying soils out or gravel underneath there, the garbage trucks go by and that starts to break the road down. We have so, one quick question yep. in the chat. So Dan asked, what is the best way to recondition root and seal cracks? Rubber is still in the crack, but separated from the walls and have no overband left. Okay, excellent question. Uh, we actually, Bill Zerfus and I did a study on this back 20 years ago. And we found that if you just go out there with like a crumb rubber or a 3723, take your uh, uh, air compressor, blow the crack out. If there's something flopping around, pull it out, cut it off, you know. But if most of the sealant's still there and just overband it, it definitely helped with the performance and it was very cost effective. Don't try to reroute it because you just, all you do is mess up your router bits, you know, you gum it up, but just, if there's sealant still in there and it's you can't reach down and pull it out by hand real easy, <clears throat> then just overband it with either crumb rubber or 3723. Excellent question. Okay. Too big of cracks. So, well, the one question about backing foam. If, if I was having to hot pour this crack here, I would be putting backing foam in it, but there's better processes. <clears throat> I'm just gonna use a generic term, mastic. There's polyfiber, there's several different, there's fiber modified, there's aggregate modified, but to me, they're all in a similar classification. There are hot pour, crack sealant, and pothole filler. I'm not so sure how big a pothole you can fill with them, but but uh, for wide cracks and cup cracks, they work well. Uh, there are polymer modified sealant. They have a, either a specific aggregate mixed into them or some of them have fibers mixed into them. Uh, very durable. They do an excellent job of filling large cracks. Now that said, they need a special melter. You can't, if you've already got a Bearcat or a Craftco a hot pour melter, you can't melt these this material in there. I think you would destroy the pumps and everything else. Some place I was down to Iowa last week calling on county engineers and, and one of them was telling me how he was using this mastic to adjust his structures with pretty good success. There are numerous supply. So, one of the key things you have to do with this material is you have to make sure you have it at the recommended pouring temperature. <clears throat> and then you need to keep it tight. You can't leave a lip here. Uh, MnDOT's maintenance crews uh, did a uh, mastic job on US 12, west of where I live. And they did it too late in the season. I think they got in too big a rush and the sealant was a little cold. Maybe they didn't push down on the box hard enough. And so they were filling cup cracks. So they ended up with a lip, a little bit of a dip where the cup crack was. They took most of it out and then another hump. So we had a hump, dip, hump. So we went from kathump to kathump. Well, anyhow, the next year, the district microsurfaced the road. And the micro did good at filling the dip between the two humps, but you still had that hump up there. And I drove this road a couple of years ago before they mill and overlaid it. And it was still boom, boom, boom. That's that mastic was so tough. It hadn't, the snow plows hadn't chewed it off and stuff in there. So keep the material hot. Do a good job of putting down pressure and feathering the edges out. Uh, I know when we do mastic cup the crack cupping, the filling, if they're very deep, we'll use a narrow box to fill the 
cup and then we'll come back with a wider box to feather it out. And you can see here where he's pushing down real hard on the material. <coughs> it's a great product. So this contractor here has built these little, well, you can buy them now, these little go-karts they call them. They go up to the melder and they pour it in there and it's got a heater, the uh, burner so they can keep the material hot and then they can feather it in. And you can see this is, they're doing a two-step process. They put one lift, one lift in, and now they're putting the next one on it. And they're doing a great job of keeping this edge down tight. <coughs> Recommended recommendations. Uh, number one, let's limit the number of cracks in the pavement. How do we do that? We need to use a proper performance graded asphalt binder when we're paving. If you're doing, if you're city or county or there and you're doing new construction, MnDOT recommends using a minus 34. You've got two numbers. You got a 58 minus 34. 58C is your high temperature. That's your rutting resistance. Minus 34C, that's your low temperature, the crack resistance. A lot of people want to use the 5828 because it's cheaper. Well, at 28 degrees C, if it gets below that, it's going to crack. For minus 34, you got to get below minus 34 C, and I don't remember what those equate to, but minus 34 should most years exceed, be colder than the normal low temperature we get. So start out using the proper PG grade of paving. Uh, seal cracks as soon as they appear, one or two years afterwards. Pick the best process for the cracks. Is it a project where clean and seal makes the most sense? Or is it one where route and seal makes the most sense? Pick the best time of the year. Dry, clean cracks. Cleanliness is next to godliness in crack sealing. Uh, clean, the, clean and seal. Clean the cracks. Fill the cracks. Neat applications. Dry cracks in roadways. Route and seal, cut the cracks, route them, clean with compressed air, condition with a heat lance, don't burn the pavement, fill in two steps, neat tight over bands, protect new sealant from traffic, and that applies to clean and seal too. <clears throat> and I go back to this picture here, and is there any questions? We have a question from Dwight. How does mastic repair compare with air patching? Well, I think air patching, if the operator is very uh, skilled, very qualified and caring and can do a great job. One of the problems I've seen with a lot of blow patching or air patching is they leave it humped up and thinking it's gonna squish out and it doesn't and so you make a bump. Uh, when I was a maintenance supervisor, we would rent a Duramax or Durapatcher and we'd always put somebody out there with a garden rake or something to level them out. Uh, I think if you got a real deep cup crack, depend on how the person makes the blow patching material. If he gets the asphalt and the aggregate ratio exactly right, they should perform similarly, but they tend to over asphalt them. So they tend to be a little more fluid or flexible. You may get some copying where with the mastic, if you strike that off level, that stuff is pretty tough. It's not gonna cup. So cost wise, I'm guessing blow patching is probably cheaper than doing mastic because the production is probably faster. Either one of them is a good tool. Uh, if you've got a lot of cup transfers, cracks like every 20 feet apart, uh, you might want to look at doing microsurfacing because you get to the point where you can do a whole surface treatment for about the same money as if, if you're hiring it as you can do to treat each individual crack. So. Next question from Rich is, settling has been a problem regardless of process and type of materials used. Is repeat filling of wide cracks 
an inch and a half to two and a half inches as the material settles, just a normal aspect of filling cracks that large? I, I would think so. What's happening, Rich, if you would go out and, and uh, do a test pit, everybody thinks of cracks like this. And they probably are when they first start, but as they get older, they become teepeed when we've done test pit. And so what's happening is we're turning this uh, HMA down here at the bottom is turning back to gravel because the moisture is leaching the, the uh, asphalt off of it. And as that happens, we're weakening the surface. The other thing is if the cracks haven't been sealed in the winter time, we get moisture in there with the icing chemicals and, and salt water when it freezes, has a bigger ice lens than fresh water. And so it humps the road up and then they fall down, they do this. <clears throat> so if you've got a cupped road and the cracks are a reasonable distance apart and they continue to cup on you, I would continue to come over them and fill them with a mastic or, or blow patch, whatever is there. I mean, you're basically, to me, there's, three categories on the road there's preventive maintenance that's when we're doing the route and seal that's early in the pavement's life there's reactionary maintenance that's when we're doing uh more clean and clean and fill because there's too many cracks or out and seal and then you got the life of the what i call the hospice on the road the road you know that it's on the tail end of its life and i'm hoping the road you're talking about rich is one that's getting older to where it's a where it's an issue so now you're just trying to keep the road safe for the traveling public with a minimal amount of expense that's the reason why i say we put it in hospice and without seeing the road i'm guessing that's where you're at but if you've got a road like that rich and uh you want me to come out and look at it and we can kick the tires there's no cost so you got my contact information Next question is from Sheldon. He asked, after using heat lamps, how quickly should cracks be filled? Uh, since we're not heating the pavement, all we're doing is tackifying it as soon as possible, but, you know, a couple minutes. You know, normally they got the uh, compressor with the hose out in front of the truck pulling the compressor or the compressor mounted in the truck, and then they got the heat lamps guy behind or gal behind. And then you got a pickup pulling the melder and then you got the melder. So, you know, even if we try to do it instantaneously, you know, you got 50, 60 feet of space in there. So, so yeah, just yes. as soon as possible. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, if I heat lanced it today and I didn't fill it till tomorrow and the weather was good, I would make them go back with the air compressor and re-blow out the reservoirs tomorrow and reheat lamps. Drew asked, is tea patching better than mastic? What was that, tea patching? Yeah. I'm not familiar with the tea patching, so I, I couldn't answer that question. And then Tanner asked, how long should we wait until after it rains to crack fill? Ah, that's going to depend on the day, the time of year, uh, what type of soil or what granular you got underneath there. Uh, it, he's doing crack filling, he's not doing rot, uh, rotten seal. What I would do if I thought it was dry enough and I wasn't sure, I would blow them out good. And you can sort of see what's coming out. If it looks like it's coming out wet, then you're probably not, don't want to go. But then I start and pour a few. You know, and if they bubble a lot, it sounds like popcorn popping. It's way too wet. <clears throat> it's sort of a judgment. That's the last question we have right now. If anyone else has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Yeah, otherwise you can email them to me or get a hold of me and stuff. And, and you know, uh, I love doing classes in front of people because we, interact but 
this has been one of the better Zoom classes I've been because of the questions you folks ask. And it helps me remember stuff because, you know, I forget stuff. So there's there's one more question yep. or a couple more. So do you need to heat lance with a reseal of an older rotten seal? Uh, no. You could, okay. but you could if you've got the personnel. But uh, when we did the study, we just did a blow and blow them out good. And then anything that was real loose, we pulled out by hand and took like a utility knife and cut them off, you know, and just there. But yeah, if you had it, it probably wouldn't hurt anything. Next question. Joe asked, is there a good overlay in the North Metro to look at for placing the joint adhesive between the new asphalt and curb? Ooh, North Metro. <laughs> uh... <sighs> Joe, send me an uh, email and I'll try to find out because uh, I've been, you know, when I worked at WSB, the municipal group, uh, our municipal engineers did it, but I would just make the recommendation. But a lot of the projects I didn't go out to look at, but I want to check and see if North St. Paul did it, but I can get a hold of the uh, engineer there. And if you send me an email and, and then have him give us some, if he did it, I think he did last year, uh, streets. You know, I'm I'm getting frustrated. I'm 67, and 20 years ago, I if something was done to a street, I could tell you the street, the block, and everything. And now it's like I remember doing that, but where? So. Looks like that's all the questions for now, and I know we're over the time we planned, so we can. We can wrap up if that works for you, Tom. Oh, it's fine with me. I it, okay. I hope it helps people out. And remember, if you can only afford to do one thing, it's crack sealing and crack filling. So thank you so much for your time, folks. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'm going to end the webinar now.